Namaskar. Yeah, you, you look uh, very bright and shiny <laughs> after, <laughs> yeah, after recent trimming of your beard and all the stuff. And you look much younger too. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Uh, so last time, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, I kind of uh, asked you to explain why Vishnu, Vishnu Tattva, why like accepted by everybody, why should it be so supreme and only the supreme entity as far as Mandvacharya is concerned? What is the necessity for such a, uh, I even called it an obsession for Vishnu, the word I used. So you were kind enough not to get upset by that and you, you explained. Um, I mean, it, that conversation was triggered more for the sake of everybody who is listening to understand because, well, given that everybody is accepting Shankara Ramana, everybody is accepting Vishnu Tattva, there is no need to have asked that question. But I ask this question because in my judgment, you know, our improper it is, there are a couple of things which really, really differentiates Madhvacharya's philosophy and compared to others. One is um, he labors a lot, not only emotionally, but even logically and scientifically, according to me, because I find a lot of parallels in modern science, scientifically labors to establish the Vishnu Tattva as the one and only, um, um, what should I say, only real entity, real and permanent entity. Everybody accepts supremacy, although you argue Madala. But the speciality of Madhvacharya um, is that Vishnu Tattva is the only legitimate, real, permanent entity. Everything else is a dependent entity and therefore it cannot be permanent and therefore it cannot be uh, Swayam Prakasha. It cannot be because it's dependent entity. You know, that is, is seems to be the very, 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 very important uh, distinction between his approach and others. And in which case, I, I suppose that is probably will, will connect with uh, what you're trying to do today. What, what is that Viseshatva? Right, that you, you're going to probably, and that, that would lead you to define a Visesha concept and probably in what way does it uh, um, uh, delineate his approach when compared to other, other philosophies is, is my guess, after all, it's only my guess. So I leave it to you and then let's have it today. Thank you. Sri Guru Bihar Maha Hariko, Marasimha Akhila Jnana Matudhanta Divakaraha, Jayat Yamita Sajjana, Subha Shakti Payonidhi, Abraham Bhangarahitam Majalam Vimalam Sada Ananda Virtha Matulam Bhaje Tavatra Yapaham Apada Mauli Variantam Guruna Akritim Smarit Sena Vigdha Pranashyanti Siddhanti Jamanorataha Sri Guru Bhyur Maha Harikom Harikom Harikom. So, last time what we were looking at is this uh, understanding of the Vishnu Tattva itself. Are you able to hear me? Because just in case there is some parallel sound that you are able to hear me, I can. Switch off the fan over there. If like it's not a problem. How much is that's not bothering? Don't worry. You are able to hear me clearly, right? Don't worry very clearly, yes. So last time what we had looked at is, uh, you know, we were uh, trying to catch up and see that, you know, basically our, um, after we delineate the uh, epistemology, wherein, you know, you have uh, Pratyaksha, you, you have Anumana, and then you have uh, the Vedas. So these are the sources of uh, valid knowledge for us. And uh, within Pratyaksha, Sakshi is the ultimate arbiter, not just uh, no, for, for any knowledge, Sakshi is the ultimate arbiter or the validator. And uh, any you may come up with any theory, finally Sakshi has to accept that. That much we had told. And now we are trying to drop the ontology that covers everything that we know there. So the first thing that Acharya says is uh, what is meant by reality? Okay, so first he the definition that he gives is uh, anaropitam tattvam. Actually, Jayadhirthara gives this one, but uh, it's kind of pulled up from many other places and uh, anaropitam tattvam. Anaropitam means that which is not superimposed is real. So. Uh, what you see as uh, the rope in the uh, the sil the snake mistakenly understood as snake right that's, that is uh, uh, not a tattva that is asat that is unreal 
on the other hand you have uh, you know whatever objects that we see here our own senses of time our own sense uh, the fact that there is pratyaksha the fact that there is anumana all these things they are all tattva so we do not ex admit that there are gradations the way uh, advaitic theories or you know uh, some of the other non you know people who don't who are called are idealistic uh, theories right they don't uh, they don't admit the same thing here they admit that only there are orders of reality kind of thing we do not admit of that we say that all of them are real uh, of course there are some things with, there are two what do you call uh, points on the axis uh, either it is unreal or real there may be a mixture of both but never uh, something that is neither real nor real kind of thing it is that you know what do we call as the law of the excluded middle basically there is nothing which is uh, neither of this kind of thing so unlike for example let's say you know uh, pleasure and pain right you can have degrees of pleasure you can have degrees of pain uh, and um, there is but it is not a boolean thing or it's not a quantum thing unlike your real or unreal kind of thing now after having defined that right now you take different scriptures and then uh, within that also acharya has said uh, uh, you know what is meant by sadagama we looked at that part also if you remember right sadagama is that uh, uh, he gives the list of he enumerates that uh, list he says you know the four vedas mahabharata mula ramayana pancharatra uh, you know the uh, brahma sutras these are called sadagamas and they are swatah pramana okay the veda is the actual thing there because it is apaurusheya it is the thing that tells you about everything that is beyond your uh, uh, sensory perception the atindriya padartha whatever is there the veda only has to tell you about that so we would consider the veda and all texts that are aligned with the veda so mahabharata is a pramana for us because it is aligned to the veda okay another way to look at it is mahabharata is a veda tells us acharya quotes this thing in brahma sutra bhashya that shri vedavyasa is an avatar of narayan it is there in mahabharata itself it comes in puranas also okay and uh, uh, mahabharata is written by shri vedavyasa who is an avatar of narayan and this is told in the veda itself he quotes uh, chaturveda shikha and all these things right uh, we can go to the specifics later but let's get the concept uh, first so narayana's avatar is veda vyasa there is another pramana which says that all vachana of all words of narayana are truth there is, he doesn't lie very important point okay because he has given us tamasa puranas and he has also given us Uh, but we consider buddha as an avatar of vishnu but acharya says na vishnu or vachanam kwapi mursha bhavati kaschit kwachit never does vishnu lie right and it is such an important concept that you know supreme lord does not lie he <laughs> will come to that and and uh, you know we are all used to hearing as at least from madhva um, what do you call uh, pravachanas or lectures that you know we, we keep referring to this asura mohana quite a bit so people think that you know lord's biggest game is to just keep deceiving everybody around it is quite the contrary okay so anyway that will come to that thing later so he has anything in line with uh, veda we accepted and therefore the puranas and the itihasa whichever is in line with the veda is also a pramana for us brahma sutras are pramana because the veda tells that you know adi uh, purana tells these things sabda jatasya sarvasya yat pramanam yad nirnayam udahrutam something like that is there in skanda purana which is uh, quoted by acharya and uh, even by uh, sudarshana suri of the vishishta dvaita lineage right he also quotes this thing um, so he quotes the uh, so therefore brahma sutra sar pramana and not only that even bhagavad gita right bhagavad gita which is part of mahabharata he is given by it given to us by veda and in the Brahm, in the maha bhagavad gita there is a reference to the brahma sutras as the as the nirnayaka as the conclusive text so brahma sutra padaischaiva hetu madhyar vinishchitaihi 
Krishna tells that you know the Vedas may appear very uh, you know divergent in their opinions. Krishnabir Bahuda Gita, okay, but they are not uh, divergent. It is you know Gati Samanyat. There is only one final purport that is out there. There is no uh, divergence in their opinions, and uh, so that you have to understand using the Brahma Sutras, right? Um, so at least this is the Madhva rendition of that verse. There is a different interpretation given by Shankaracharya, and Jayadirtha has a, uh, he has an objection to that also. We will leave that thing for the timing. We will try to focus on trying to understand how we are fine trying to form the ontology here, right? So now, given these, so one is Mahabharata is a pramana. The Puranas that are in line with the Veda is a pramana. The Brahma Sutras are Parama pramana because you know they are they for all. the literature they are the ones that give the highest nirnaya so this these are all epistemologically they are you know there are there are these are all different positions from the what the regular mass looks at literature as for for most of us right you know there are different margas or different panthas saiva is there vaishnava is there shakta is there that those all come later right for us the main thing is epistemologically let's try to figure out what is our pramana then we can figure out you know what do they say right uh, so it is it is uh, interestingly we are not doing a content based evaluation here because we admit that that content is atindriya there is no way i can judge whether a shaiva purana is right or a vaishnava purana is right or uh, anything like that based on the content i can only do that based on the what do you call the Praman, the pramanya has to be decided by other factors. See, if I told you, right, uh, you know, you invest in this stock, the stock will go up in uh, uh, what do you call another two days. It is a verifiable fact. You will trust me or not trust me based on whether uh, you know I have many such instances of uh, such being correct or not correct, right? The content in the scripture is not verifiable like that. it has to be verified based on who told it that's what uh, gautama says this thing okay tad uh, tadvachanat ishvara vachanat tat pramanyam right okay? but we don't take that position we take that position only for the paurusheya part the apaurusheya part is pramana by itself we looked at swata pramana all those things over there yeah. so coming back to the sources we take these things now mula ramayana is there Mula Ramayana is something that has been referred in Matsya Purana and in other places like that. It has been told that it is the uh, it is uh, uh, what do you call it is like me uh, shatakoti pravistaram charitam raghunathasya shatakoti pravistaram. It is like hundred crore slokas, right? It has the it is that uh, that much in expanse, um, that much in length. So now you that is another pramana for that. Now with all these pramanas, when you try to understand when you try to understand the nature of reality around you acharya says that the first thing we need to understand is there is a we are all paratantra and there is swatantra tattva and this much is understandable some part of it is understandable from experience and some part of it understandable from uh, shastra okay so the fact that i am paratantra i am not fully swatantra is evident to me why i mean i mean say that no, i am lifting my hand if i want to lift my hands i am lifting my hands that much is clear but the more you analyze for example when you are not well okay i mean we went through this corona thing all together right so we should be very what do you call at least humble in accepting that okay we have been told you know some realities where we came face to face very strongly with some reality there right so we do not have that thing in our control right uh, we cannot control ourselves also then when you are in a coma when you are in deep sleep right um, even the so the so called control on body is also uh, very you know what do you call uh, questionable can i make a point here yeah please go ahead i, I will uh, probably it is not um, standard way is not aligned with the level which you are talking but i suppose for For sake of listeners, my example might be very helpful to them because that's what we do every day. Well, it's told as a joke in one of the social media, uh, saying that you know you better 
erase all the history in your web search, etc., before going to sleep because there's no guarantee you'll walk up alive. <laughs> 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 you know, oh, it is told in jest uh, based on people's habits of what they want to look for in the website, etc. But it drives home the point there is a universal recognition yes. that it is not in our control to decide that tomorrow morning I will be alive or I will not be alive. We don't know. In fact, recently I even saw a Facebook post where two, two friends are chatting in a restaurant trying to drinking coffee. Young people, maybe 20s, maybe 21, 22 kind of thing. As they are talking, one guy suddenly collapses and dies on that very moment. Everybody runs helter skelter, but he's dead in a second while drinking coffee. Therefore, we, I suppose, every listener will understand that uh, from this context, uh, at least from the body perspective context, body senses is a kind of perspective. We know that we have zero control on which body we will occupy. And we have zero control on when we locate that body. That much, I'm sure everybody will accept. And even the when we have vacated, uh, when we are occupying the body, it's not like it is always in our control. Right. I mean, for example, I cannot just go out and then come back or whatever it is, right? Okay. So the bondage between me and uh, this uh, bhoga yatana, that's what it is called in the Vedantic literature, right? The it is not uh, determined by me and it is not uh, it cannot be stopped by me also right yeah. i mean so many failed suicide attempts will also tell that right. but i acharya points this thing very clearly in uh, one point i mean you know see i mean you can say that you know all these things say, for example i cannot lift uh, govardhana parvata is very clear indicator that you know my limited uh, I, my strength is limited i have limited capabilities but it doesn't make me dependent I mean, people may think like that but that is also Acharya points out this thing very strongly in his Dwadasha uh, Stotra of all things, right? It is not even, it is just a Stotra, there he tells this thing. Yedinam Tasya Vashaya Sakalam Katham Yevatu Nitya Sukham Na Bhavet. I mean, this this is more internal, right? I mean, you can you can have problems with external things, right? I mean, uh, your limitations can be there. But if you are Swatantra, you should at least be happy continuously, right? So there is, if you are not, then it means that you are not in your own control itself. So that's a very powerful argument, actually. And uh, I mean, see, that's why, you know, any of these uh, uh, Sadhguru or any of these guys, right, Jaggi Vasudev, right, or any of them, when they say that, you know, they have these realizations and things like that, that experience is overpowered or even at least as strong as the, what do you call, the feeling of the, the experience of Paratantra. It is uh, undeniable. You don't, I mean, so whatever they need to at least think as to, you know, what prompted me to get to this point, at least I am not in control of that. Got it. Got it. Right? So the, so the point is that there is, we are all Paratantra is very clearly what you call given to us in experience. Let's say that everything is Paratantra then. So there, Acharya says that, you know, I mean, in fact, uh, in Tattva Sankhyana Tika, Jayatirtha points out that not everything can be paratantra. If everything has been paratantra, then there can be, there is no motion at all then. Because everybody is waiting for something to trigger. Correct. Of course, Correct. he is saying this thing from a, you know, deterministic point of view. If, if you assume a deterministic world, okay, wherein nothing has happened by accident, Correct. then you need at least one swatantra to motivate and instigate everything. That is very, very powerful logic. I also read that. Uh, that is a powerful logic in this seem to be in this context. We should not conditionalize it by saying that uh, if you are talking about deterministic uh, universe. I'll tell you why it is needed. Yeah. The, 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 my, 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 my viewpoint is this. Theoretically, I understand. I mean, the, the way that has to be said, okay. Uh, the point of fact is all these conversations, these debates, the evaluations, questioning each other, judgment, judging philosophies, accepting, rejecting, this can only be done in a deterministic universe, right? If it is a random universe, where is you, where is me, where is philosophy, where is anything? There is the question of conversation. The fact that we are having a debate, the fact that we are evaluating, the fact we want to make a judgment of whether Madhva is right or Shankara right, this presupposes a boundary condition of a deterministic universe. What so, do you say? 
Uh, so when I said deterministic thing, I meant it in a different way, basically. See, my uh, he gives one argument there. Uh, the he says that, you know, see, for example, you take the uh, the lame person and the blind person. Right, the lame person cannot walk, the blind person cannot see. So, but the blind person can carry the lame person and the lame person can direct wherever they have to go. So they are mutually dependent on each other. OK, and they are able to bring out some karya. They are able to make some effect over there. Right. So now Deitirtha says that, look, if that is the case, right, how do you what ensures that they at least meet and come to this agreement? Why do you even have to admit that? So if you take this argument to a modern uh, scientist, right, he will say that, you know, why are you assuming that somebody is forcing them to come together? It is a accidental event. An event. Right? It's a it doesn't need to have a predetermined uh, what do you call cause. So there that's why I was saying that you know if you go with the assumption that you know it is all the world is all re deterministic, right? The events are all determined by somebody's sankalpa, somebody's uh, you know plan. Right. I mean, if you remember Stephen Hawking's uh, brief history of time, the first version, right? He mentions this thing, you know, if there is something like conscious, you know, it will be determining whether we will understand that or not kind of thing, right? So, so somebody is planning and if you assume that, then this argument holds good. Okay, and that is the reason, even if you don't assume that, Shruti is telling you that, look, everything is under one person's control. So logic will take you to some extent. OK, see there, this is the, there is the, another reason why I have to uh, what do you call uh, impress this argument, uh, right? We'll come to that thing little later. So logic will tell you that, look, there has to be one Swatantra at least. Can there be more than one Swatantra? That is another question. Why can't it be that, for example, Vishnu is also there, you know, uh, Shiva is there and so many, there are many Swatantras. Why don't we accept that? The problem in accepting that is one again, it is against Shruti. Right? It says, Eko uh, Deva Sarva Bhuteshu Bhudaha. Okay, where well, is one person? Yo Deveshu Adhi Eka Eva. Right? There is only one who is the supreme most. So that particular uh, restriction is there by from Shruti, number one. Even logical, logically, as in, you know, if there are two Swatantras, they and you have to assume that they do not override each other. That is an unnecessary assumption you have to make. Or if they are not overriding, they are binding each other. So that means they are really not Swatantra then. All right. All right. So therefore, you have to assume that one is truly Swatantra and other people are, you know, behaving based on what that the strength or whatever it is the other person has given. So therefore, you have, if you think purely from a logic point of view, you will have to say that there is at least one Swatantra and there is, there is only one and only one Swatantra and everything else is Paratantra. Now, what do we call this Swatantra? We can call this thing anything, no? As see, and uh, Acharya says in, in a different context that, you know, a Swatantra, a truly Swatantra being will have infinite Kalyana Guna, auspicious act, virtues, right? And he will be bereft, he will be devoid of any flaw, all flaws. So these are very important characterizations of Brahman or God, according to Madhvacharya. Ramanuja also says the same thing, okay, but there are variations there. Okay, so others may have used the word Vishnu casually. In fact, Shankaracharya's works, if you see, he praises Vishnu also in some places, and he praises Shiva also in some places. For him, it is an uh, what do you call an empirical uh, world that he is dealing with. Disorder. Yeah, so he is not, part, and according to him, in the final analysis, um, all the qualities that you see, right, of uh, the sarvagnyatva, the omniscience, omnipotence, all of them are superimposed. They are not real. The final consciousness is bare, or you know, it is without any such attributes. So his Vishnu is different, and our understanding of the Vedic Vishnu is different. So that, I mean. Uh, Name wise, yeah, I mean, what there is no big, uh, that is no no big deal there. Okay, I mean, and uh, 
the same thing applies to you know how we con uh, what do you call how we understand vishnu and let's say how vishishta advaitins understand vishnu so so now let's talk, look at you know this thing right is vishnu the person who is a blue in color you know holding these things without nothing else i mean no other job or what i mean why should he keep holding that thing always right the shankha chakra uh, shankha and uh, uh, chakra and you know all these uh, uh, weapons and he is just sleeping on the ocean in some place right is it that much only or how is it like so our understanding is that is one of the forms of vishnu that is popular but he is by the very word vishnu he is all pervading okay in fact the word brahman means which is, which comes from the word bruha bruha means to grow right it means the same thing it, is, it means unlimited stuff aparichinnatvam yeah. okay so aparichinnatvam is unlimited this so we also say the same vishnu is also aparichinna now this is a tiny or important difference actually very significant difference advaita says brahman is aparichinna in desha kala and vastu right we say vishnu is aparichinna vishnu or parabrahman is aparichinna that is unlimited without any boundaries in desha that is space kala time and guna so we do not take it to vastu whereas uh, advaitins take it to the vastu that is one important difference of how you interpret that uh, aparichinna there is a big discussion on you know how this thing goes there uh there is also another point i would like to mention which is that you know first of all how do you even know that there are other gods at all how many gods are there so all of that is also coming to us from the veda veda is telling that you know vishnu is there shiva is there are they one or are they two see for example if uh, given that they are atindriya right how do you even know i mean do, how many eyes do they have how many noses do they have do they have anything at all or do they have just like you know 10 of them or should they will they have uh, infinite of them to answer all of these questions you need your veda in hand right so and based on uh, interpretation of that we say that there are two distinct people right so vishnu is there shiva is there all the other gods are there and why is that we are saying that there are distinct people because the veda is telling that you know it not only tells that you know vishnu is called as by all these other names ekam sad vipra bahuda vadanti yes okay it says that you know agni indra garutman all these names are there but it also is telling you in a different place right that agni is afraid of bhagwan yes right or indra is afraid of bhagwan so you cannot be afraid of yourself i mean not when you are at least when you are omniscient so it means that you know the name is what is got is getting referred over here he is called by that name in fact that is exactly how the vedic verse also tells ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti okay. they are not saying that there are there is one sat and then uh, that is what is uh, what do you call there are all these gods are the same sat it is not saying that the same one sat is called by different names right each name carries uh, what do you call what does each name convey it conveys a certain quality that is how you can explain that you know all these gods names which can convey a quality is possessed by this one being mm. okay uh, uh, at this point um i don't know whether you want to address it now or some other time i mean down the line today tomorrow or whatever there is a statement in sri madhav they i mean i as i told you i discussed bhagavatam in quite a few sundays um one of the slokas which came up i would like to quote here which i think as from uh, uh, iskan book version 3.24.31 i'll send you later tanyevate abhirupani rupani bhagavan stava yani yani cha rochante swajana nama rupina ha that is though it does not have a form yani yani cha rochante which are way you can see he appears is what is being told in trip i'm sure in, in bhagavata parin nayama Madhvacharya would have tackled this, but does it not show that when it is uh, formless, what is the Kalyana Guna you are talking about? Good point. So Kalyana Guna is uh, when we say Kalyana Guna, we are talking about uh, not just the uh, we are talking about Ananda, 
right bliss knowledge power opulence you know all these other qualities and also the fact that there are so many infinite forms there so this is another important distinction between us and uh, others right so actually the the verse that you mentioned is not really so much of a problem there it is just saying that you know whichever people feel like taking right i mean let's say there is a person who is more attuned to worshiping the narsimha rupa another person who is more attuned you know the ishta devata concept is there anyway right is more attuned to worshiping the rama rupa so they for which, so the lord has so many forms that you know people whichever they want to take they can take that and then start worshiping the problem for us comes in the uh, what do you call in the first adhyaya uh, first skanda itself right uh, jagrihe paurusham rupam it says that so he took a form it says that so the fact that he took a form that is what, that is a interpretation by the regular people but we say that you know it only it is like you know it is a linguistic usage thing you know nan kai togondu hodithini or something like that they will say right i mean it is uh, at least in kannada that's how uh, they say it is not like you know i am actually taking my hand and hitting it is just you know i am using my hand or whatever it is so the taking the form is not to be interpreted as you know assuming something that he did not have so we explain all these things for example he says the narsimha avatar right it was never seen before according to us there are because there are other puranas that acharya has given which says that all forms of lord are eternal so rama krishna their child form their youth form their whatever form right everything is eternal for us so we do not accept that uh, you know the uh, lord is formless okay uh, even if you take the this one right ananda roopam jnana roopam bha roopam if you, these are the descriptions that are found in the uh, veda so this is another distinction between us and the vishishta advaitins they say that for example you know they accept that there is something called as an archa avatar right you know for example the shri rangam idol is lord himself but they accept that it is jada we do not accept it like that we say that it is actually a jada only and lord is there within that it is not like it is his form or anything i mean you know it is not his sannidhana is there his presence is there yes. but he is not that form so we do not think that you know it is formless or whatever it is but then what do you say about the uh, the upanishad verses which says you know nama rupe vyakarana karvani all forms and the names emanated from this being so that so there acharya say i mean vyasadirtha he points out this thing also see before that also there uh, before he did this nama rupa vyakarana there is there is uh, tejas is there tat tejo uh, and you know tejas is there vayu is there there are all these other entities then he created these names and forms and he himself has a name anyway okay namaani sarvaani yama vishanti tam vai vishnum paramam udaharanti even this so there which means that all form all names they finally enter actually they they delineate they explain vishnu primarily this is what the shruti is telling us so what i am trying to uh, highlight here is um, one vishnu of everybody is different from vishnu of the veda or what madhvacharya sees in the veda and uh, Second thing, uh, Vishnu. Hold on, sorry about the interruption. That is why I said there is an obsession to show a difference. For a neutral person, it doesn't look like that. Only when you're obsessed in saying that my Vishnu is different from your Vishnu, you go to such a great length of saying all those things. It need not be. No, but you need to look at it from other way also, right? He is in impressed, uh, interested in telling you what is the truth in the Veda there. now if people have many what do you call wrong opinions right one way to remove such this thing is to repeat the thing veda itself repeats many instructions where it finds that you know people are uh, uh, you know whatever they are ignorant or dumb or whatever it is and not updating their own beliefs based on whatever is there in the veda so then you have to keep impressing upon by repetition there are many many ways in which that is done so acharya that's why he keeps giving so many quotes to say this is the vishnu that is there in the veda he is not limited to the way others have seen it he is not you know one of the products of maya or the way others see it very important point there right and uh, so i mean whether obsession when you even when you say there is an obsession and things like that right you have already presupposed that that is not how veda says it correct i agree with you i totally agree with you. i use the 
understand it from Advaitarya's point of view. This is exactly where my point. Just as we are, we choose words and concepts based on what we believe in. You know, that's why the particular choice of word comes. I believe, as you rightly pointed out, there is no need for him to do this. Everybody is accepting. Therefore, there is an obsession on his part. But you are saying very correctly. You already prejudge that he should not do this because I understand better, and therefore, it, so the same argument can apply to him also, right? Yeah, he can. Well, you have to look at the same criticism applies to him also. Ab absolutely, and that's why you have to look at the evidence and then decide which one who is biased or who is not biased, kind of thing, right? I mean, so then you look at his this thing, right? Uh, for example, I mean, there is, I mean, you have to look at his entire first adhyaya of Brahma Sutra's interpretation, Gita interpretation, to get there. And I think there is an important distinction between him and others in many, many, on many grounds, actually, right? I mean, the Advaitic Vishnu versus the, what do you call, the Vedic Vishnu is very clearly different, or Madhvacharya's Vishnu is very clearly different. That is a better statement. <laughs> no, don't say that. I mean, that is more politically correct statement, but <laughs> that's why you have to look at the evidence, for example, right? Uh, for example, Acharya says this thing, right? Um, uh, what do you call? Uh, uh, there is one Vedic uh, line which I am not able to forget. Uh, get right now. One minute. Let me get that thing there. Uh, Nate. Uh, what do you call? Nate Vishnu Jayamano na Devaha. It says that thing. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, no, one I know. So it, he says this thing that you know there is no deva who is born uh, or yet to be born, okay, who is as uh, who has ever reached your glories, Vishnu. They say that thing, okay. So there are such. I mean, this is just one example. He also quotes other uh, shlokas, right? Uh, uh, I mean, what I'm I'm trying to not get into this interpretation part yet because that is a long drawn process. I'm trying to understand, first communicate the conclusions. Then we will come to know. Tell uh, we will come to the part where we show the evidence part. There, but there is enough evidence, right, uh, which tells that the common belief or the Advaitic belief is uh, what do you call not well considered. At least that let's put it like that. It is uh, there is uh, what do you call there is not enough. Uh, there is a lot of counter evidence uh, to the regular position, and there is also. Uh, evidence to the uh, Madhva position on why Vishnu is considered supreme. The part of, you know, it is not just about, you know, that name there, right? I mean, what is there in the name, right? Whether it is whether we call that Vishnu or Shiva. Anyway, our theory is that he is called by all names. So the dispute, is it just purely on the name or is it on, okay, whether who is the, uh, you know, I mean, it's not just around the name. What does that Tattva relate to is what we are looking at. So we are saying that there is a Vishnu Tattva, okay, which is commonly known by Vishnu name, but it also has many other, all the other names also reach him only, or primarily they denote him according to the Shruti that he gives. Namani Sarvani Yama Vishanti Tamvai Vishnum Paramam Udaharanti. So very clearly this Shruti, this Shruti tells you that he is the bearer of all names. Yo Devanam Namadha Eka Eva. So all names are... So when you look at these things, then you will have to come to the point of saying, okay, there is one God who is the supreme and the other gods are not supreme. So then there are many other uh, statements which you have to take. For example, you know, Apahata Papma, uh, Dibyo Narayana Eka Eva, something like that, it comes there. We looked at the Mahopanishad uh, Vakya, Eko Narayana Asit, Na Brahma Na Shankaraha. It's a thing, right? So these are the Shrutis that are used to tell that, you know, only Narayana existed at the beginning, and therefore, uh, and not only that, he created everything. And there is another uh, verse that Acharya mentions in Rig Bhashya, which says that you know Indra and uh, Rudra, they do not, they do not, uh, what do you call, uh, understand the uh, the acts of the Creator. Pratham, uh, Pratamna Minanti Rudraha. I mean Indra and Rudra and all these people, they do not understand the acts of the Creator. So these statements are used to tell that there is a supreme being who is not Rudra, who is not this thing, who is not 
Indra, who is not Soma, who is not Brahma. And there is also a verse which tells you, there are shlokas which tells you that this Vishnu who has done that. There is also a shloka which tells you that, you know, Ajastyanabha Adhyeka Marpitam, right? The, the, the being from the unborn, from whom all these worlds have been born, are born out of the lotus. And there is an equivalent thing in the Puranas which corroborate that that particular shloka relates to Padmanabha. That is the, I mean, not to, but to, uh, to the Lord. It's an important point that I mentioned, you know, why not you? I mean, why can't it be you? I mean, what if you put a lotus here? Will you become the referent of that verse? Why not? I mean, you know, so you will come to these things. Those things are important from a, what do you call, interpretational uh, framework point of view. Correct. Right. Uh, so based on these evidence, it is very clear that Vishnu is, uh, has infinite Sahasra Sirsha Purushaha. It says that thing, right? So Sahasrakshas Sahasrapa. Very clearly, the Purusha is one who has infinite heads, infinite eyes. Why am I interpreting Sahasra as not thousand and as infinite? It is because there is another uh, Upanishad which says that it is, he has Ananta. Ananta Sir. And even uh, if, if it were to be taken literally, right, it means one eye per head, which is like not how he is depicted elsewhere, right? I mean, so there are other, and it also tells, the, the Veda also tells that knowing this form, knowing this fact that he, such a form of Narayana is the creator, is the one that leads to moksha and nothing else. Okay. So that is the reason why we say have to, act, we have to keep impressing upon people that Narayana is different from what you think it is, right? The only other people who come close in this particular formulation is the, uh, the Vishishta Dvaitins. But they do other mistakes. I mean, at least according to us, right? Uh, for example, they admit, they think that Vishnu and his gunas are different, though they are inseparable. Aprithak Siddha. Okay? But they are different. Now, your Shruti is telling you that whoever thinks of Vishnu and his forms or his gunas, evam dharman prithak pasyan, whoever sees them, even thinks them as different, Yes. Right, he will fall like water falls naturally from a mountain. So the Katopanishad says this. So therefore, our understanding of Vishnu is different from theirs also. So we think of Vishnu as a homogeneous one entity. You know, forms, qualities, all of them they are one entity. Okay, and uh, there are no internal differences. So that needs us to use the idea of Vishesha. And we will talk about that in the next uh, session. Excellent. Excellent introduction for you. And we say one word called Visesha. I yeah. based on the ground, logical ground for why well, you need a concept. I mean, you can always start creating concept from your point of view. But legitimacy of such a concept in the continuity of your thought, when you're trying to develop an hypothesis at the beginning, we have to realize, or until we realize what our Madhvacharya says ourselves, it's still a hypothesis for us. Therefore, from the beginning of the universe, from the origin of species, from being born, um, Laksha, species being born as a human being, having a purpose of ending the cycle of birth and death through an understanding, a realization of Vishnu Tattva, which is the one and only independent reality with Ananta, Kalyana Garguna Paripurna concept, you know, that's why he's building up. And then he leads up and says, if you do this, you know what's going to happen. This is what moksha is going to look like. In other words, uh, like I have said it many times, I have not seen any other, not only in India, in Western philosophy also, I've tried to study here and there. 20, 25 different type of philosophies I've tried. Uh, what do they say, really speaking, from ontology and uh, epistemology and soteriology, whatever it is called, moksha concept, etc. Nobody has taken the trouble of divine defining A to Z. That way, I really appreciate his, uh, you know, it's a gigantic intellect. You know, I, I, I'm sorry, an unimaginable intellect he's got to put all these things in all, all the ducks in a row, as we see here. Which, that is, he has done very well, and I'm very happy that you are taking the same, same path instead of simply saying that, oh, I, it was to my, 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 what do you call it? Madhvajaya, then this one, Mani Manjari, and things, it's all going like that. You are trying to do the similar path, right? Uh, I, I, I know you will, you will object, oh, please compare me, and then you hear like, yeah. 
only that actually it is this is the path that acharya has laid out for us i am <laughs> i am not i am not doing any value addition at all there i i agree i agree i agree but but again you so see this is another point right when you try to speak about something you have a choice right everybody makes a choice every, every pravachanagara makes a choice sitting in a mata and somebody speaks they make a choice because there are thousands of books to talk about thousands of ideas to talk about he cannot talk in 45 minutes to hours even even a saptah he cannot finish it up before he has to make a choice the choice that every pravachanagara makes defines the pravachanagara because that's you, know, you choose what you like honestly so that's why i like what you're doing particularly you know there's a you know we've been doing for quite some quite a few months and then i i don't think i'm not seeing any any waning of the interest whatever you know i'm not thousands of people even a few hundred people are reading it I, the same number keeps fluctuating but similar around there about and people send keep messages to me saying that please don't interrupt at least twice a month you publish is very interesting i don't make it more than 45 minutes make it smaller for us to understand <laughs> because their people's abilities all worldwide to read anything beyond 20 minutes is very limited oh. yeah yeah that way i really appreciate what you are doing and particularly knowing fully well that i am pretty ambivalent i am kind of on one hand open to all philosophies with a personal liking for shankaracharya you know everything still you are doing it a very very even keel i really appreciate you for it and thank you for that okay, okay. see you next week